Previously on Who Killed Amy Mihaljevic. The search for Amy has lasted for four months. This picture of the Bay Village girl has been placed in every public place possible with the hope that someone, somewhere, would have information leading to her whereabouts. The halls were noticeably quieter, a sign the students have learned a disturbing lesson about life and the tragedy it sometimes holds. I'd say rather than being frustrated, the, these people are determined, mm -hmm. uh, and that shows. They just uh, keep trying as hard as they can and doing everything possible. A female jogger was jogging this morning at approximately 7.30, and uh, she spotted something in the field and went off the field and checked, and it was a body. The body of a young female uh, found in Ashton County early Thursday uh, morning has been identified as uh, that of Amy Mahalovic. Disgust that something like that can, is ha can, can happen, mm -hmm. uh, but you sort of were expecting it after such a long time. Uh, I can only say that uh, there were stab wounds to the left side of the neck. Can you say how many? No, I can't say that. Any uh, possibility of sexual molestation? Uh, I can't say that at this time. Well, it, uh, it certainly isn't what we were all, and every one of you two were hoping for. I am Bill Huffman, and thank you for listening to Episode 4 of Who Killed Amy Mihaljevic. On this week's episode of Who Killed Amy Mihaljevic, we're going to take a look at the investigation that took place once Amy's body was discovered on February 8, 1990, and where the investigation stands today in 2018. When Amy's body was found that day in February, it was like another punch to the gut to anyone that had held out hope that Amy would somehow be found alive. The discovery of her body led to more questions and, again, no answers. What was her body doing 50 miles away in what can only be described as a completely remote area? Where did Amy go before she met her final resting spot? What is the significance of where she was found? You heard in the previous episode that if a killer is going to dump a body, they are generally going to do so in some place they are familiar with. I can attest to the remoteness of this location as I drove down there with James Renner a few years back. There is no way this spot was randomly selected. So connecting the third or fourth crime scene in this case is something that will finally bring an answer to who killed Amy Mihaljevic. So 29 years later and the idea of being able to find that third crime scene is one that seems like a long shot. But what if finding that scene isn't what will actually close this case? A few months ago, a 30-year-old cold case involving the murder of 8-year-old April Tinsley was solved using a new form of DNA testing. They were able to trace this perpetrator to the crime using a type of familial DNA tracking. The Mihaljevic case is one that has now reached the stage where science may be able to help fill those missing pieces and lead us to the killer. When I met with Chief Spetzel of the Bay Village Police Department, I asked him whether or not he thought we were closer to an answer now in 2018 than we were in 1990 when Amy's body was discovered? That's a great question. It's really hard to say because, again, I, the cases evolve, right? And cases grow. So they're not the same size as they were back in 89. This case is as big as it's ever been with more names, more suspects, more interviews, more everything, um, more resources. So it's hard to say that because there's more resources being involved that we're closer. I can say that we have a better perspective on the case because we, you know, as we analyze it and we talk to people, you get a little bit of clarity, but we're nowhere near having the clarity to solve it uh, without some more information. I asked James Renner what he thought the role science would play in the conclusion of the Amy Mihaljevic case, and this was his response. Another thing that I think the prosecutors and, and police might be putting, you know, the rolling the dice on or, uh, uh, and, and what might be keeping them going is this things like this arrest of the golden state killer, you know, where we've got new ways of using DNA and, you know, all these cases, these cold cases are being solved now by using DNA to track down distant relatives of the killer because they're able to get that mitochondrial, the, you know, the DNA that's passed down through, um, you know, I think the father's side of things. And uh, so that gives you a spread of like, well, the killer's related to this group of people from 
you know, Decatur, Illinois, or uh, or Indiana, or wherever Decatur is. And uh, so that gives you at least a place to search and people to talk to. And that's how all these cold cases are getting solved. So if they do have some sort of DNA from Amy's body, I think soon, and soon being like the next year, uh, we'll be at a place where we'll be able to narrow down enough to figure out who this person's potential family was, and that'll give us an idea of which suspect to look at. One of the great joys of technology is the fact that it improves on a daily basis. And that is one of the reasons why there is no statute of limitations on the criminal offense of murder. Because despite what any killer may think, they probably left something behind. And the same goes for Amy's killer. Just look at how all these cold cases are being solved on what seems to be a weekly basis. In regards to April Tinsley, her case was 30 years old and involved an 8-year-old girl who had been abducted and raped as well as murdered. And her killer remained at large for over 30 years, but was arrested due to the new advances in DNA technology. April Tinsley disappeared on a spring day in 1988 while walking to a neighbor's house. The eight-year-old's body was discovered in a ditch three days later. She had been raped and strangled. Today, authorities announced they have finally solved it. Prosecutor Karen Richards. This case has haunted this community for 30 years, and I believe you have given us some closure. Police Chief Steve Reed. 30 years. 30 years this family has waited for answers. The answers came from genetic genealogist C.C. Moore. We had enough to work with that I was able to narrow it down to two full brothers. Investigators say they arrested 59-year-old John Miller after matching his DNA from the crime scene and from taunting notes he wrote to local residents threatening to kill again to genetic information posted by his relatives on genealogy website. 40-year-old homicide finally solved years later because of DNA. Yeah, the mentally challenged teenager disappeared from a state-run hospital in 1979. The new DNA evidence helped lead Oregon State Police to her killer. Some genealogists are raising alarms about police searching a public DNA database to track down the alleged Golden State Killer. California investigators use GEDmatch.com to name Joseph James D'Angelo as a suspect in at least 12 murders and 50 rapes in the 1970s and 80s. The free website allows people people to find distant relatives by comparing their genetic profile. Despite being just a little less than 30 years ago, 1989 was very prehistoric when it came to technology. And if the technology existed today, back then, then this case would have been solved in 24 hours. And Chief Spetzel is one of those people that believes that is the case. Unlike today, Back in 89, there's not surveillance cameras throughout everywhere. So you don't have anything to go by and say, well, let's pull up some surveillance film and we can catch something. Didn't exist back then. I've read that the amount of leads on a missing persons case can be overwhelming. And I wanted to reach out to Chief Spetzel in regards to that case because in that research, it said that in the first 48 hours, you are most likely to receive the tip that will resolve the case. No, that's a great question because initially most of the leads uh, that were generated by the public were lookalike leads. Okay. So we literally got hundreds a day of lookalike leads. So everything was documented. Everything was eventually put into a database. And those lookalikes range from, you know, I was driving down I-71 and I saw a male in a car and there was a young female in the car with them and that's all I got. It was a red car. So, you know, you obviously, some of these you, you eliminate because there's nothing you can go by and others are more specific. Uh, you know, this individual looks like him. And then from there, of course, you can go back and establish alibis. So there were hundreds and hundreds of those types of leads. And again, at the same time, you're looking, uh, your typical investigative techniques, you're looking, okay, who would know this child to be able to walk up to him in the middle of the day at a shopping center and walk away with her? There's got to be some familiarity. So you look at people that might be f close to Amy. You start doing that, of course. And then you start looking at, since the, it, it involved Margaret, the mother, being given a gift, is there somebody who knew that Margaret got a promotion or a job change that you know, would have resulted in a gift being purchased? So all that's going on at the same time. 
what somewhat muddies the waters in this case, and, and although it was inevitable, there's not much you can do about it, was the lookalike tips that came in ate up a lot of resources and time. So you have to look at those because like uh, you alluded to, Mark Mahovic said, you don't know which one of those tips is not the right one. You, you just don't know until you follow it through. So we took everything um, and ran with it, and it, it was overwhelming despite the fact that, you know, we're a small department. We had 24 police officers at the time, but we did obtain the resources of the FBI. We had over 50 agents working in this case at one time. So even with all those resources, it was still a little bit overwhelming to work that case. And, and from the beginning, because of the volume of calls, I literally uh, was new then, of course, and one of my job was to answer phones. And this is the back in the day when you had the little phones with the push buttons that would light up when a call came in. Mm -hmm. Those lights never went off. You would literally finish a call, hit the next button, and take another tip. And it just went on and on and on. And that's a great thing because that means people are involved and they're engaged and they're looking at it. Uh, and then the flyers went national, so you're getting calls from outside the area. Uh, and all that, like you said, has to be sifted through and gone through to make sure. And we have looked at those things several times. This case has never been a cold case. We've always looked at it, and that's one of the areas we've done. Let's go back and look through all the, the tips that we really didn't follow up on, make sure we're not missing something. And the reason we are, we have, we're conducting an electronic database now of everything, because we don't know what tip back in 1989 will become important in 2018 because we got new information. So all that has to be retained, all of it has to be searchable in some format uh, so that if another tip comes up, we can search our database and try to find connections. In some cases, family members can be a constant reminder to detectives who are working the case. But Mark Mahalovic feels like he should have a hands-off approach to Amy's case. And that is the way he feels with Chief Spetzel. We have a good relationship, good relationship. but it's been like this from day one. Solve the case, come to me. Well, I mean, to call them every week. Well, what's happening this week? What's happening? Yeah. What did you do? What did you eat for breakfast? I mean, that's just... They know their job. That's, They're doing it. It's really fortunate that he's... Uh, not fortunate for him, but for him to... Uh, seen this whole case from beginning to present. And he could have retired. I mean, he could be out of there. With everything that has and has not gone on with Amy's case, I asked Mark Mahalovic if he was happy with the progress the case has made in the past few years. Oh yeah, yeah, and I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not saying what they did uh, 28 years ago was bad. Right. It's just they're like uh, this guy. I don't know. If, he's in town right now. Um, yeah. Phil Torres. Phil Torres is in town. Yeah, <laughs> he is a bloodhound. When I was meeting with Special Agent Phil Torsney, I asked him. Why was it that they brought him back on the case? You know, when I came back and started working on this after retiring from the FBI, I started working, you know, back again locally. What year did they bring you back? Uh, I believe it was 2013, maybe the fall of 2013. I retired in the spring. And it was the following fall when uh, Prosecutor McGinney... Uh, and I, I talked to a couple of prosecutors down there, and, and Prosecutor McGinney called me and asked if I'd be willing to come back just on a part-time basis. And that was the fall of 2013, and I did, uh, I was working overseas for a year uh, during that time. Uh, and, you know, some breaks in service there, but, you know, on a part-time, I've been coming back here to Bay Village or to the Cleveland area working on it part-time for, uh, you know, once or twice, you know, usually once a month for a period of a week to 10 days for, for a couple of years with, with various breaks. There is a consensus of confidence in one special agent, Phil Torsney, in being able to track down Amy's killer. James Renner, he feels the same about Phil Torsney. And Torsney is, is brilliant. You know, this is the guy that brought in Whitey Bulger. Right. You know, so if anybody can solve this case. It's 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 him and, and Spetzel. When I met with Special Agent Phil Torsney, I asked him about the peaks and valleys in an investigation such as Amy's, and his response was very candid. You know, peaks and valleys, ebbs and flows. We are in a very good situation at the moment, 
where as opposed to maybe 15, 20 years ago with technology sort of not where it is today? I mean, do you feel like we're closer to solving the case today in 2018 than we were yeah. in 1990? Uh, I guess I'll answer that in two parts. I mean, history tells you with these cases and really any criminal activity, the, qu the quicker you can solve it, the quicker you can get the information that leads to an arrest. Uh, the easier it is, well, the easier it is, and, and evidence is always uh, more open and more available the closer you are date-wise or whatever to the crime scene. So that, it, that makes it difficult 30 years later, but we have, or 29 years later, but we have 29 years of investigation moving forward, and there's things that have happened in that 29 years, including forensics and science that have opened up new doors uh, for a lot of cases that have been recently solved and uh, have the potential to help us solve this case. So it's a, you know, it is what it is. It's a two-way street. Some things are better, but some things aren't as good because of the passage of time. And, uh, you know, I know if we, if we had all the knowledge we have now in regards to science and, and um, you know, just uh, research and criminal behavior and that kind of thing. Uh, if we had that back in 1989, I mean, we'd, we'd be in pretty darn good shape here. You know, just, phone, just the ability to access uh, phone numbers and phone tracking and that kind of thing, which we had to, to a very limited, limited extent in 89. But, you know, now you can, you can check phone calls, you know, you can figure out where a phone call came from pretty quick via, you know, uh, the legal means to do that. So, plus there's surveillance cameras everywhere. If we had, a, if we had, had a surveillance camera in Bay Square Shopping Center in 1989, we'd be in good shape. But, you know what, uh, they're there now, but they weren't there then, and that, that hurts us. But it doesn't mean there's not things helping us. And uh, we, we, we're moving forward with that. Welcome to Storytime. I'm Stephen King. Beware the boogeyman as the stories are true. Because there's something in the shadows waiting for you. Keep the lights on. Check under your bed. Close every closet. Or you'll sleep with the dead. From the mind of Stephen King, The Boogeyman, directed by Rob Savage, rated PG-13, may be inappropriate for children under 13, now playing Sleep Tight, Boys and Girls. So technology in 2018 will lead us closer to a resolution than what we had in 1989. But I want to go back to what it was like for Margaret Mihaljevic shortly after Amy's body was discovered. She gave a press conference where she thanked the city of Cleveland for their support. At any gift be a living remembrance to one of two organizations. The Lake Erie Nature and Science Center, because Amy loved animal, animals and loved to learn. And of course, to the Community Fund for AMY to protect the children of the present and the future. We feel that donations here in these two places would serve as a tribute to all those who have helped in the search for our Amy. We don't have anything else to say except thank you, Cleveland, for all your efforts, for all your hope, for all your support. For all your caring, and bless you. As Margaret learned to cope with the loss of her daughter, the city of Bay Village had to begin to move on, and that began with the Amy Center closing its doors. After more than four months, the Amy Center today closed down operations here in the Bay Village Engineer's Office. More than 200 volunteers got involved from as far away as Hudson and Wadsworth, they spent thousands of hours distributing more than a million and a half Amy posters nationwide. Margaret showed up at the 
Amy Center on the day of its closing to thank volunteers. Amy's mother, Margaret Mahalova, came by to meet Adam and thank all the volunteers. She says even though it's too late for Amy, she still wants Adam's song released. It's a plea to bring our children home. Amy was one. Fortunately for our family, she received a lot of support from the community, but she's only one. Jacob Wetterling is still missing, Melissa Braden, Alexis out of uh, Kentucky, and numerous others. On October 27, 1989, authorities began their search for missing 10-year-old Amy Renee Mahalovic. But after her body was found on February 8, 1990, authorities began the intense search for her killer. Those first 109, 8, 9 days, whatever it was, we were looking for Amy. After that, we were trying to solve a homicide. So all resources went to finding her. And whatever we had to do to locate her, that's what we were doing. County Road 1181 remained closed for a number of days after Amy's body was discovered. The ground was scraped around the dump site with the hopes of finding any additional evidence that could help provide the answer to this case. And according to reports from the day after the body was found, law enforcement authorities said they would be conducting hundreds of interviews in Ashland County, as well as continue to comb the area where the body was found, looking again for anything that would help find the killer. The ground has been scraped by investigators for soil sample analysis. Another portion is covered with flowers left by shocked residents who now have more personal reasons to help in finding Amy's killer. Lieutenant Richard Wilson said that more than 100 tips about a possible suspect had been called into police in less than 48 hours after Amy's body had been discovered. There was a report that a car with its trunk open was seen on Ashland County Road 1181 at night, the week Amy's body was found, and according to FBI spokesman Robert Hawk, he said authorities were investigating. Conflicting information was reported the day after Amy's body was found, according to the Plain Dealer. A source said a hunter had reported that he had not seen the body when he was in the field about a week before the body was found. On the contrary, a spokeswoman for the Ashland County Coroner's Office said it appeared Amy's body had been at the roadside for a considerable amount of time, but wouldn't be able to say how long. What we do know is that Amy died from two stab wounds to the neck and blunt force trauma to the back of the head. I think it's important to note the unreliability of the eyewitness because according to the Innocence Project, eyewitness misidentification is the greatest contributing factor to wrongful convictions proven by DNA testing, playing a role in more than 70% of convictions overturned through DNA testing nationwide. So regardless of how much that composite sketch is seared into our memories, it may not even be close to the person who took Amy. The sketch has been downplayed in recent years, and James Renner had this to say on the subject of the sketch. You know, Spetzel over at Bay Bay Village Police, he's really kind of backed off on the composite sketch and said, you know, look, this guy might not look anything like the sketch. I tend to think he looks very similar to that sketch. Again, we go back to the fact that even if these eyewitnesses were able to make a composite sketch, who's to say that the sketch that they made is actually the person that abducted Amy? It's very similar to like if you're walking down the mall, in a mall, and you kind of bump shoulders with somebody and you look at them and you keep walking. Somebody comes to you a day or two later and says, hey, I need a detailed description of that individual because he, he did something in the mall that I need to know. Now, factor in the fact that it's a 10-year-old that got bumped into and has to provide that description, you know, that's the reliability of that information. And not to say that it's not important, it's extremely important. But what we don't want to see happen is people put all their faith in that drawing. That, hey, if he doesn't look like him, it can't be him, or, you know, vice versa. Uh, But at the time, on October 28th, 29th, that's all we had. So we put out those drawings, um, and what we got was a flood of lookalikes who may be the suspect because they look just like that person. The jawline is the same, you know, the glasses are the same. And we had to go with that because that's all we had, you know. So that general description is probably fairly accurate, but certainly not conclusive one way or the other. Mark Mahalovic had his own thoughts on the composite sketch. It looks like John Denver or something, I don't know. 
As James Renner said, the chief of police has downplayed the sketch over the recent years. Two people at the Bay Square had seen a male with Amy, um, and they both described this male to a artist. And we uh, uh, created a composite drawing from each individual. And, the, and these were both 10-year-olds as well who saw Amy with this individual for a brief second, standing in the area of where the current Bay Barbershop is. Actually, it was present back then, too. But the thing about their witness identification is, you know, this wasn't a struggle. There was no screaming or yelling. This was not a violent abduction or anything like that. They just saw Amy up there, like everybody else, who's hanging around up there on a beautiful day, going to the, going to the ice cream parlor or hanging out by the bowling alley, and said hi to Amy, and um, at some point saw her standing there by this pole, and then at some other point saw a male standing with her. And kind of one of them indicated that uh, the, this male put her, his hand on the middle of her back as if to escort her to the parking lot, and that's all he saw. I asked James Renner what his perception of these two witnesses were. When you were 10 and you saw somebody who was, say, 21, 22. Oh, they, they could have been 40 for all I knew. And two eyewitnesses who witnessed Amy's abduction just so happened to be 10 years old. Yeah. And what? let's say that their perception is off. Maybe the abductor was a 20 year old with a wig on and glasses yeah i don't even maybe i mean yeah you look at the hair now and you think oh is, is that a wig it could be um you know it didn't even need to be a wig or or fake glasses i mean just the fact that they're 10 that this yeah you're absolutely right you know they they would think that this is a middle-aged man but it could have just been a man in his early 20s. Could have been pretty young. I wanted to know if Chief Spetzel had looked into the sex offenders that had been in the area when Amy was abducted as well as when her body was discovered. It's so easy sometimes to get wrapped up in the emotion. Keep in mind, too, that we looked at every sex offender from back in the day. We looked at sex offender lists. We looked at anybody who had ever been arrested for making phone calls to kids. You know, all these people were looked at, right? These are people that already have a prevalence to want to commit these crimes. And they, again, necessarily can't be ruled out. So you have this wide range of folks that you're talking to. When I met with Special Agent Phil Torsney, I just wanted to know if they had looked at everybody regarding sexual orientation as well as sexual history. What I don't want to do, what I don't want to do is limit it. Say something that would say the way, because we don't know the answer to that. Okay. That would limit calls in on an individual. It could be a guy who's, uh, who's had prior sex offenses with young girls, but then it could be somebody who uh, has an, had a, a, a one-time opportunity and committed an offense. I, I don't, I'm not comfortable limiting, limiting, limiting it to that because we want all that information. Chief Spetzel also reinforced this idea of keeping an open mind on looking at everyone involved and not basing anything off of orientation or preference. Yeah, we don't. We look into everything. It doesn't matter because, again, there are exceptions. You never want to rule anything out. Um, so not unlike the composite, uh, just because we don't rule them out. So uh, if they have a, 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 you know, their preference is young boys, it doesn't mean we're not going to look at them for this. If, uh, you know, um, they like girls that are 13 to 15, doesn't mean we won't look at them for a 10-year-old. Because there's always exceptions. There are, uh, you know, they, they also um, experiment with different things. So you just, you just don't know. You can't rule them out based upon that kind of thing. One of the themes that I've been going with on this podcast is the passion behind the searchers and the investigators. For some of them, I understand that it is their job, but for others, I do wonder what it is that makes them continue the search for Amy's killer. I asked Chief Spetzel if he thought the case loomed over the city. I don't know if it looms, but it's always there. And if you remember back in 89 when this happened, um, it really, I mean, this is a very close-knit community. Always has been. I think it always will be. But this case kind of galvanized it even more. Mm -hmm. uh, people really came together. Like you were talking about going trick-or-treating. Every parent was out walking with their child on that, on that Halloween. They weren't walking alone. 
Um, there were ribbons throughout the whole city. It, it brought the community even closer. And I think that is part of it, that, um, you know, it got national attention, but obviously got a local lot of attention. Uh, and I think people still remember it because, again, it's such a abnormality to have. Uh, well, first of all, let me say that, you know, throughout the United States, on an average year, about 100 plus kids go missing from non-familiar abductions. Um, and a lot of those are, are cases where it's just a snatch and grab. You know, a child's walking down the street, guy drives by and, and does that. Um, unfortunately, many of them are found deceased, but very few of those 100 per year fall into the category of what this one was, which is a planned abduction, non-family planned abduction of a child for sexual purposes, and then the child is found you know, dead sometime later. It's such a unique case. Add on top of that that it occurred in a city that is often considered one of the safest in Ohio, where people come to live because of the safety and the good schools and the you know, proximity to the lake, and it's kind of like their little you know, isolated, secure environment. And then to have something like that happen in that makes it even more abnorm you know, abnormal. So I think you put all those factors together. You've got this high level of interest. You've got this high level of we can't allow that to happen uh, because this is where we feel safe and you violated us and we need to do something about it. Um, so I think all those factors going together are, are what drives this case and continues it on and, and, and motivates people. Plus, again, 10-year-old girl. I asked Chief Spetzel about working with Special Agent Phil Torsney and whether or not he felt that his expertise is something that will bring this case to a close. But Phil being on board has been great because there's things that we want to do and did want to do that we couldn't because of manpower. And because of his familiarity with the case, he can just jump right in, go out and do interviews, follow up on leads without a whole lot of education on my part. If I was to bring you in, you're a new detective, I'm going to bring you into this case, it would take me months to get you update on where we are, what we're doing, why this, why not that. He can just jump right in. And so um, the, the, the city is also helping to pay for him to be here, but all that money is, is starting to run out now. So eventually, um, you know, he's probably not going to be able to continue but having said that, I will, I will tell you this about Phil, and I will tell you this about any other detective that has worked this case. Mm -hmm. If something comes up that looks very promising, that you know it's just a matter of putting manpower to it, these guys will come back and work for free. I'd come back. I'll probably be retired by then, but they'd all come back and work for free. That is how uh, personally involved they become in this case, to the point where you, know, you don't have to pay me. Just tell me what i got to do. I'll be there. I'll help you. That's the mentality of all the detectives that have ever worked this case because they got, you know, you're talking about a 10-year-old girl. An innocent 10-year-old girl from a very safe suburb disappears and is found dead, and it just shocks and rocks the community, right? And, uh, but it also affects everybody personally because everybody's got, most people got kids, and yourself, you were that age. I can only imagine how your parents felt. Um, so you start to take it personally like, you know, this guy, we don't know if he's done any other crimes. We don't know if he will do any more crimes, but... One thing we know we want to do is identify them, arrest them, and get them off the streets, put some closure to the Mahalovic family. They deserve that, and not allow this person to perpetrate anymore. So they're, they're willing to come back and do that for free. They've all told me that. When I met with Special Agent Phil Torsney, he emphasized the importance of the public and the importance of calling in a tip, even if you may not believe your tip means much. Little things mean a lot in a case like this. It's a big puzzle, and a little piece could fit into something we already know. We know a lot uh, about what happened, and we have a lot of information about a lot of uh, possible uh, uh, perpetrators and that kind of thing. And, and we're uh, with science and some of this other stuff, we're trying to make it happen, and we're going to continue to do that. There have been varying reports as far as the amount of suspects. Some lists say that they had a number all the way up to 120. Some other reports say that the list is down to 25. Chief of Police Mark Spetzel refused to even give me a number. I do not have a short list. I mean, there are certainly, like I said, people that we spent a lot more time on than others because of the circumstances of their, their 
um, what they've been involved in. And um, but I will tell you that from reading about cases somewhere, that sometimes it's the ones you don't expect. It's the ones you're not really looking at heavily. Special Agent Phil Torsney also was very limited on his candidness regarding the suspects in Amy's case. Oh yeah, there's thousands and thousands of tips and leads, and there's there's many many uh, individuals that we've talked to uh, on the you know uh, on the range of individuals who are just you know possibly were in the wrong place at the wrong time. The people that we we are, uh, you know, continue to look at as possibly being involved in this. There's a whole range of those people, but there's a lot of them. And uh, uh, a lot of people have been very cooperative with us and tried to help out. You know, we had that composite sketch, really. There was several of them released at one point. And, you know, a lot of the calls were just, this person looks like your sketch. One of those sketches or this and that. And there was some different behavior that, you know, made people uh, somewhat suspicious. So... Uh, that's been going on for years and years and years, and uh, we were in the process of winnowing through all that and trying to. We, de- we have to prioritize at this point. You know, it's uh, you know there's certain things we're trying to do. Additional media is one of them. Uh, you know, obviously looking at science and evidence is another thing we, we're doing over and over and over again. Uh, fact check. We want to make sure our facts from the beginning. You know, going all the way back to the beginning, we're correct as far as uh, that goes because if you get something wrong at the beginning, it can affect your whole investigation. And we think we're pretty pretty good with that, with what actually happened. But there's people out there that may have a fact about uh, this case that they've never brought forward for whatever reason. And that's that's... That's something that would be of great interest to us, even something somebody didn't think was important back then, but maybe it's they're saying, I should have called 29 years ago. We want that call. According to Renner, Spetzel and Special Agent Phil Torsney are the two perfect people to be on this case because they have been there since the beginning, and he is confident that they will be able to solve this case. Other new clues that have come out, of course, are you know they held this big press conference about two years ago, where they revealed uh, a big new piece of, of of evidence, which are these kind of ruddy green, military green or or um, curtains, you know, that were made from uh, fabric that. Uh, or it almost it, looks like a duvet cover or yeah, something like yeah. that, or like a almost like a hotel spread. Almost you know? like it, like a bed sheet that had been hand sewn into a curtain at one time, and that was used. They now believe it was used to wrap Amy's body. Um, and prior to when she was placed in the field where her body was found in, in Ashland County on County Road eleven eighty one. And sometime, at some time during the, the, the time that her body was laying in that field, the cover came off. And so when they, when they discovered everything, the, they found this weird blanket curtain thing, but it was pretty far away from her body. And they, they always wondered if it was connected or if it was just random junk. And uh, this FBI agent, Phil Torsney, who's working the case now, had them retest it. And that's when they found... Uh, dog hair on the fabric of that that blanket curtain thing that matched to uh, Amy's dog from her home, from her childhood home. And somebody was really smart back then to take a sample of her of her pet's, you know, her pet dog's hair. Yeah, at that time they really weren't thinking DNA too much. I mean, they DNA just... was DNA was really just on the cusp of. It was super new. They were they were thinking about it though. Um, so eighty nine was when she was abducted. Eighty nine is also the first year that DNA was used in a trial to convict a uh, a murderer. Authorities have been reluctant to name suspects over the years, and that is fair. But we will discuss some of the suspects that James Renner has narrowed his investigation down to in the coming weeks. Coming up next week on Who Killed Amy Mahalovic. So that's why we try to keep names quiet. We don't we don't throw out names. In fact, that's never a good thing to do. Well, I mean, the, the biggest thing is all three of my top suspects, who I think are the most likely killer, 
Um, you know, in my mind, it has to be one of these three. None of them were actually in the book, you know? The book generated so many new clues and, and, and so much new information that there were, there were better stories and better suspects that came out of it. What would it be like for you to call Mark and say you got the guy? Oh, that would be, that'd make my career, absolutely. That would be, um, that's what we hope for, is to be able to do that. And, and I don't have any personal stake in it that I have to do it. I just want somebody to do it. I want somebody to be able to call Mark and say, we, we, we think we've got the guy. One of the most difficult kinds of abductions to investigate is when the victim is somehow lured, as in the case of Amy Mahalo. The FBI says her abductor may not even resemble these two composite drawings because they only came from the memories of two 10-year-old If you are interested in supporting independent journalism, such as this podcast, you can click on the Donate button on the bottom left-hand corner of WhoKilledAmyMahalovic.com. If you could leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts, that will also help support the show and help get Amy's story the coverage it deserves. You can contact the Bay Village Police Department at 440-871-1234 if you have any new information. The FBI is offering a reward up to $25,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the individual or individuals responsible for the death of Amy Mahalovic. Anyone with information concerning this murder should contact the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. You may also contact your local FBI office or the nearest American embassy or consulate. Thank you for listening to this week's edition of Who Killed Amy Mahalovic. Stay tuned next week for Episode 5, The Suspects. 3 a.m. The comedy horror podcast that holds weekly gatherings around the campfire. Let me tell you what you're going to get. You're going to hear stories about demonic possessions, prison stabbings, skinwalkers, glitches in the Matrix, cult leaders, missing 411, night marchers, Operation Paperclip, Mesopotamian devil worship and so many monsters it'll give Kanye West a runaway for his money. Pop and meme culture also aren't off topic. A camp where laughs and scares are constantly competing for first place. We're just a group of friends trying to bust each other's balls, find the best stories, and expand the circle in the process. 3am, the comedy horror podcast not for the faint or fragile of heart. Let's go. Are you tired of seeing your teen or young adult struggle on a path that clearly isn't the right fit? Is your teenager confused about which direction to take after high school? The future of work is changing rapidly, and our kids need to know all of the options available after high school so they're empowered to make the choice that is best for them. In each episode, we explore the latest trends that are shaping the opportunities of today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Betsy Jewell, and this is the High School Hamster Wheel Podcast.